Welcome back, I'm Captain Xavier, and one uh, topic I've gotten a lot of questions about, and then there's been a lot of discussion on the various boards and uh, the Discord and the comments and all of those places, uh, is concerning patches. And so this video is going to be uh, a brief explanation of heraldry and how it applies to the auxiliary and how things should be done and why they're done that way. Heraldry uh, goes back to ancient times, uh, when it was particularly big in the medieval era when they finally started having colleges of heraldry and <clears throat> specific rules on, on how heraldry should be done and how it was written down and, and explained and, and that allowed it to survive uh, to today. And heraldry is the, you know, the study of symbols that are used to identify people. Uh, we see it today in brand logos and, you know, there's heraldry on your cars and, and, and all of that. And most companies have, you know, a logo that is theirs. That is their heraldry. Um, and that is what, you know, things like these symbols are as well. Um, militaries use them for identification. Companies use them for, you know, to promote their brand and things like that. And there are specific ways that they are talked about, historically speaking. Uh, there is a whole language that is specifically designed for heraldry so that one herald can describe um, a symbol to somebody else and they would be able to reproduce it simply from those words. Without ever having to see a picture of it, they know what it should look like because there were standards. Um, for example, this is my personal device that goes back to my medieval recreation days. Um, I refer to it as the fleur de mor. It was meant to look like a skeletal fleur de lis because my character was a French pirate, so that was um, fitting. But the proper heraldic term for it is sable, a sheaf of thigh bones argent, which means black background. That's what sable means. And then a sheaf is any three things crossed, whether they're arrows or spears or, uh, in this case, thigh bones. Um, that is referred to as a sheaf. And then argent is the heraldic term for white or silver, which incidentally is why the uh, periodic abbreviation for silver is AG. Um, so if somebody were to say, sable, a sheaf of thigh bones argent, a herald who heard those words would know that it should look like this. So they would probably have it crossed more towards the center than uh, lower though, that I have it. But still, um, that is how heraldry works. And... For battlefield identification, the symbols are should be very, very simple. The whole point is that you can, at a glance, recognize uh, somebody's device and know, okay, well, that person's on my team, so I shouldn't kill them, or that person's on the enemy team and I should kill them. Uh, it is the closest thing to uniforms they had back then, and it was important because people wore helmets that covered their face, so you had no idea who they were uh, except through their heraldry. And they would have it on their shield, or they would have it on, a, on their tabard, or a, a flag, or something, so that they could be easily identified. The cruise symbol comes from the pirate flag that was used by Emmanuel Wayne, in, uh, which is actually later than the medieval era, but it was the skull with the bones behind it, and then an hourglass below it. The hourglass symbol meant that your time is running out. And we adopted that flag as our flag, and then chose to use this as what's called our device which is a, a simpler uh, concept. Uh, your coat of arms would be the really complicated ones with all of the fancy stuff that your family has earned or accrued or been awarded over the years. But your device would be something that was much, much simpler, also referred to as your badge, um, or in our case, patches. And we simplified it to just the hourglass because that's very, very simple. It's easy to make a stencil of because it's an equilateral triangle. It's just the one that you then flip over and do it again. It's very, very simple. It's white on a black background because that is maximum contrast, which makes it easy to identify at a distance. And it's a simple shape. The auxiliary is, of course, just the, um, the triangles flipped over. And we did that because there is a distinct relationship. And often in heraldry, if there was a relationship, either a, a, a father-son relationship or a, an in-law relationship or a, a fealty relationship, you know, one clan that's sworn fealty to another clan or something along those lines, uh, their heraldry would reflect that. They would be similar but slightly different so that you could tell that they were related but that they weren't the same thing. Uh, so that is why we went with that. And again, it's designed to be very, very simple. It's and very, very uh, high contrast. Uh, heraldry was needed to have that high contrast to make it easy to identify even at a distance. There were only five colors that were regularly used in heraldry, which is red, blue, green, purple, and black. And then there were two metals, which was uh, silver and gold, or white and yellow is how they were generally done in heraldry. Um, and you wanted to have 
contrast. You never wanted to have a metal on another metal, and you tried not to have certain colors on other colors. So you wouldn't want to have white on yellow, because from a distance, you can't see the white. It just all looks yellow. And you wouldn't want to have green on blue, or blue on purple, because those colors blend together at a distance. Um, it's even... Generally, you don't want to have any color on another color, though you can get away with, like, red on black or green on black, uh, depending on the shade of green. Um, but in general, you wanted to have a metal on a color and a color on a metal, um, which is why we went with white on black, or... Uh, there isn't actually a, a orange much in uh, medieval heraldry because it wasn't a common color in Europe, um, but it would have gone down as a metal. I, I, imagine, I always thought of it as copper. Uh, as a third metal. So it is acceptable to have orange with uh, as a background. So um, when you're making a device that you want to be easily identified, keep that in mind. It should be simple and there should be a high contrast. Um, now, that is for your badge, for the one that's intended for identification, which is what the hourglass is, the, the fleur de mort, or the, the auxiliary symbol, or even the X-Strike symbol, uh, or in this case, the Black Knight symbol for when I do uh, NPC roles as... Uh, a respawning human, uh, we refer to that as a black knight. Your um, squad badge, on the other hand, your company badge or your club badge, those can be as complicated as you like, similar to the family crest, which were often multiple badges all thrown together or overlaid on top of each other and with the, f the animals and the, the crown and all of that. That can be as complicated as you want because that isn't intended so much for battlefield identification as more of a show of pride or of unity, of you know solidarity, being a part of something. And so those can be every bit as complicated as you want. Um, and people have come up with some fabulous you know crests for various companies. I know the uh, the auxiliary, which I love that name, um, came up with you know ones that uh, incorporated the. Uh, the, hour, the, the, the auxiliary symbol into, you know, a common um, animal or, you know, concept that was, uh, you know, inherent to Australia. And that is perfectly acceptable and um, awesome. But it needs to be in addition to the auxiliary one. So a lot of people have come up with badges that include the auxiliary symbol, but as part of a larger picture. And I have no problem with that, as long as it's worn in addition to this one. Somewhere on your gear you should have just this symbol. Not as a part of another symbol, not with writing across it, not, you know, mixed in on a skull or something like that. You should have just this symbol. Uh, white on a black background. Now, if you want to paint this symbol on your blaster, but you want to use the colors that match the rest of the color seam, that's fine. You can, you can use different colors, you can use different shapes, you can have it, you know, on a skull, you can have it on a spider, whatever. As long as you also have just this on you somewhere for the ease of identification. Because if we look over and we see a patch and we have to hunt through and find, oh, there it is, yeah, the, the hourglass is hidden on the left leg of a moose or something. Um, that's gonna be difficult to spot in a hurry. Whereas if we see this on your shoulder or on a headband or, or somewhere, we know, okay, they're auxiliary, fantastic. So, yeah, do all the fancy stuff, have this one in addition. Now, um, there are also two other squads that exist within the crew uh, and within the auxiliary. They are not permanent squads per se. There are squads that will likely exist in most of the events, but they're not a company or a squad that you would join and always be a part of that squad. And those are Feral Squad and Omega Squad. Those are squads that get created... Uh, out of necessity. So when we're at a last stand and zombies like to then mass for a huge charge and charge all at once, we create Feral Squad to break the charge. Before their charge can reach the line, we send Feral Squad in to break up the charge. Because once the momentum of their charge gets broken, it doesn't recover. Um, and they get scattered, they get messed up, they, they lose the unity of that big charge. And that is what we use Feral Squad for. They are shock troopers. They are berserkers. They are sent in to break the enemy's formation. And that's where they f started back in our medieval recreation days when we were fighting enemies that actually also used shield walls similar to our own because shield wall to shield wall is very, very messy combat. But if you can break their shield wall before your shield wall hits it, it works. So we'd send them in to either blow holes in the line or to flank them or to, to bust up their formation so that our formation could then overwhelm them. And in some cases, Feral Squads did so well, the enemy had been wiped out by the time we even got there. Um, Omega Squad is a similar concept. They're also created 
um, generally when we're doing a last stand or a defense of a location sort of thing. And they are dedicated super zombie killers. So in a lot of games, you'll have super zombies that can only be taken out by certain weapons. They can't be taken out by rival or regular darts. You need mega darts or rockets or socks or something, uh, some special ammo type to take them out. And that is what Omega Squad is there for. They are made up of people who are armed with the weapons designed to kill supers. So that if there's a group of supers or attackers, or there's one particular super that's attacking, uh, we send Omega Squad to go take them out. But it isn't like there's an, a single Omega Squad that's roving around for the whole game. They tend to be created as needed, which is what happened at Ragnar Oktoberfest. Uh, Omega Squad goes back to the WSU HVZ days, and uh, Sergeant uh, Lance was part of that, helped create that, and still wears the pauldron on his gear to this day. And so when we got to the last end at Ragnar Oktoberfest, and there were a lot of supers that I knew we were going to need to... Um, have somebody prepared to deal with, I ordered him to put together a squad to deal with that. So we went through and looked through all the people that were around and found people that had mega, that had socks, that had rockets, um, and formed them into Omega Squad. And so uh, that is why we are, that still continues, and that will be carried on. And we'll probably likely get led by him if he makes it to that point. Um, so those are the two squads. You're welcome to create a patch that has an Omega symbol on it, or the Feral patch that we see online, which is a wolf skull uh, with the auxiliary uh, logo. Those You're welcome to wear those. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will be in those, though there's a good chance you will be, because we look for the people who are interested in being a part of those when the chance comes. So we generally would call for volunteers for Feral Squad or Omega Squad, and that would be our opportunity to join in. If we don't get enough, then we'll, you know, assign people to it. Um, so yeah. These are all 3D printed, which is awesome. Some of them are actually still very flexible, so they will form to, you know, your, your arm if you have them on your arm or something like that. Some of them aren't so flexible because they're not designed to be. Um, if you don't have access to a 3D printer, luckily we've got a lot of auxiliary members who do. One in particular, one person in particular who uh, designed this one for me and designed this one for me, and I recently made a really cool uh, patch for myself um, that was all thanks to him. Um... He is on the auxiliary. His name's uh, John Jean. I assume it's Jean. I think he's... I don't know where he is. Um, but uh, he has an Etsy shop, and that is where he is selling both patches, custom-made patches, custom-made name tags, dog tags, all sorts of cool stuff for the auxiliary. Um, his uh, Etsy link will be down in the description. You can reach out to him through there or through the auxiliary board um, to get name tags, dog tags, what have you. I will be bringing auxiliary patches with me when I go to events. These ones that I had designed that I can print out. Um, they have the Velcro on the back. They've got the logo painted. I will be selling those mostly to help cover the cost of travel. Um, I will also be making these, um, which also have the Velcro on the back. And these I will be giving out as commendations. So if I see you do something particularly cool at an event or you save my neck from a zombie that jumped out at me or... You know, if we're doing something that's got, like, you know, capture the flag or something, and you are the one who captured the flag and, and got the points, that's what I'll be giving these out for, and you can wear them um, anywhere on your gear as you see fit. Um, there may even be a slightly fancier one that will be even more um, prestigious, as it were, but I, I like the idea of being able to give out commendations. Um, so, yeah, there's the basics on, on, on heraldry, on badges and patches, and, and what I would really like to see. I love seeing the complicated stuff, but I really want you to have the simple one there as well. So, I hope to see you guys uh, sporting these patches at your own personal events, and definitely want to see as many as I can at future events. Uh, are still working on additional merch, t-shirts, armbands, headbands, that sort of thing. Stay tuned for that. And bangerang! Bangerang! <laughs>